It's been said that you can take a map of Europe and draw three circles, one focused in the south, that's the wine culture area, one in the north and west, that's the beer people, and one in the north and east, that's the spirits or hard liquor people. All three circles only meet in one country, the Czech Republic. We've already done an episode about beer and another one about wine here, so now we're going to get in the spirit with an episode all about the spirits in the Czech lands. A city is much more than just a collection of buildings. It's a location, it's a history, it's a culture, it's ideas and ideals, and a city is also, most importantly, the people in it. This is Prague Times, the podcast that takes a look at the city of Prague in the Czech Republic. With more than a thousand years of history, there's a lot to talk about. We'll talk about the past of Prague, but we'll also talk about the city as it is today, future plans for the city, and much more. It's Prague then, Prague now, and Prague later. And this is Prague Times. The word alcohol comes from the Arabic al-kul, which means a powder made from sublimation. The technique originated somewhere around 1200 BCE, probably in Babylon and other Mesopotamian civilizations, and was originally used to create powders for facial makeup and eyeliners. It was also used to distill or purify water. Basically, you take a liquid and you boil it so that it turns into its gaseous or vapor form. This vapor then passes through various tubes or pipes which are at a lower temperature in order to cool the vapor and make it condense back into liquid droplets. But any impurities that were in the original liquid are no longer present in this new liquid. If that original liquid had certain other substances in it, like grains or fruits or sometimes even vegetables that have already gone through alcoholic fermentation, that alcohol would become part of the clearer liquid after the distillation process. This makes liquor, in the U.S., hard liquor, because the alcohol content can sometimes be quite high. The word liquor comes from the French word liqueur, which means fluid. They are also sometimes called spirits because they are the essence or spirit of of the original liquid, purified. Back in classical ancient Greece, wine was sometimes distilled, Aristotle makes mention of it, but in the 9th century CE, the Islamic Golden Age scientist Jabir ibn Hayyan discovered that adding salt to the wine ahead of time increased its volatility, and so the vapors produced during distillation were headier and had more alcohol in them. By the 12th century, Europeans were writing of making, quote, burning water, and around the same time, what we might call true modern alcohol distillation began in China, spread to India, then to the Middle East, and then, finally, back to Europe. Vodka, from a Slavic word meaning little water, shows up in Russia and Poland as a byproduct of cognac making in the early 15th century. In that same century, brandy was invented in Germany, which they call burned water, and whiskey was developed in Ireland and Scotland from a Gaelic word also meaning water. Today, of course, there are lots and lots of different types of liquor and also liqueurs, which are sweet distillates. Czechs and Moravians drink plenty of them, and a few are even unique to these lands. The king of the liquors is Slivovica a fairly clear fruit brandy made from fermented plums. The word comes from an old Slavic word for plum, sliva, and then this ovica ending on the end means kind of thing made out of whatever the previous syllables were. So you have sliva vica, but you also have marunko vica, made from apricots, hruskovica, made from pears, malinovica, raspberries, barufkovica, blueberries, jahodovica, strawberries, and I've even seen jablokovica, which is made from apples. All Slavic lands have some variant on this kind of alcohol. Usually it's over 100 proof, which means 50% alcohol. In the Balkans, they call it rocky. The German word schnapps can also kind of be applied to this type of liquor, though that actually has a much broader meaning and also includes herbals and flavored liqueurs, which have sweetened added syrup to them and also infusions. This stuff is usually drunk from a shot glass called a panak in Czech, meaning dummy. A classic accompaniment to Slivovica is škvarky, which is little bits of deep-fried chunks of pork fat. Yeah, I know. 
One of the largest purveyors of Slivo and other Ovitsas is the company R. Jelinek, R. for Rudolf, who took over the family business in 1926 and stuck his own name on it. The company was actually started in the 16th century in Wallachia, a pastoral region in the far east of the country near the Slovak border, where people spoke with a Romanian-tinged accent and which boasts distinctive wooden architecture. The distillery is mentioned in a land register in the year 1585, originally burning beer waste and then adding more grain to this to make a liquor known as rye. Then in the 18th century, fruit from many nearby orchards around the village of Vizovica, just east of Zlin, began to be distilled. The precursor to the current incarnation of this company comes from 1894, and R. Jelinek quickly became one of the th- big three distilleries in the region. The other two were the Karl Singer and the Razov distilleries. Because the Jelineks were Jewish, their product was also kosher and had quite a bit of success in the United States in 1934 after Prohibition finally ended. Only two family members would survive World War II, the rest of them being murdered in Nazi extermination camps. The company was nationalized by the communists, because they nationalized everything, but returned to the family after the Velvet Revolution. Today, there are Jelinek distilleries here in the Czech Republic, but also in Slovakia, Bulgaria, Chile, and Newport Beach, California, just south of Los Angeles in the United States. The company exports to over 40 countries and is one of the largest companies of this kind in the world. Here in Prague, they've opened the Slivovitz Museum in Malastrana, right over by Manashuv Most, the Manas Bridge, and the Malastranska metro station. This contains a museum, a shop, and a bar, of course. Tours are 55 minutes long, conducted in something they call 5D, whatever that means, and that costs 450 crowns, about $20 or 15 British pounds. Seems a bit steep, but it does also include a tasting. And if you want a premium tasting, you got to fork out an additional 100 crowns. However, many people consider their product to be too rough or too sweet or not sweet enough. And this country is filled with people who like to make their own ovitsas at home or at their chata, which is their weekend house. Slivovica and other fruit brandies are also a large part of any traditional zabayechka or pig killing, where a pig is slaughtered and over the course of the day the entire animal is used to make various food items. And much, much Slivovica is drunk during this experience, which often starts at 5 in the morning. A liquor wholly unique to this country is Becherovka an herbal bitters digestive from the spa town of Karlovy Vary, or Karlsbad. It tastes kind of gingery and kind of cinnamony with anise and herbal notes, a little bit like drinking a shot of Christmas, but with attitude. The recipe is a very closely guarded secret known to only two people and contains more than 20 separate ingredients, some of which come from as far away as Zanzibar, Sri Lanka, and South America, while others grow in the surrounding forests. It's 76 proof or 38% alcohol and over 8 million liters are made each year, sold in nearly 40 countries, even as far away as Japan and Brazil. Today, the company is owned by a French concern known for their anise-flavored aperitifs, Pernod Ricard. Josef Vitas Becher started playing around with hard liquor making back in the 1790s. In 1805, the Westphalian noble Prince Maximilian Friedrich von Plettenberg traveled all the way from western Germany to Carlo Vivari to seek cures for the various ailments that befell him. The prince's doctor got into a conversation with Mr. Becker about what exactly was ailing the prince, and Becker started experimenting. Two years later, he had created what he hoped might be a curative for the prince. Because the prince's doctor was English, Becker called it an English bitter. It became something of a hit, and Becker's son expanded production of it in the 1830s. Soon, the newly renamed Karlsbadak Becker bitter was being sold in many countries. By the end of World War I, it was available as far afield as Egypt and Turkey. After World War II, people of German extraction were expelled from Czechoslovakia, so the family had to abandon their company. That was then nationalized under the communists and became a rather successful export item throughout communist Europe. And then in the 1990s, it reverted back to the Becker family. In 1998, a guy named Zdeněk Hoffman started making Becherovka in the town of Domažlica near Pilsen and selling it in Slovakia. 
He claimed that Alfred Becker had given him the secret formula way back in 1939 so that it wouldn't be lost when it looked like the Nazis were about to invade. Oh, and Becker also gave him permission to make it and sell it. In 2003, an investigation was launched, yet Hoffman was unable to produce anything that legally constituted proof. He was found guilty of fraud and spent 18 months in prison. And once again, the Bekarovka company was the only one making this stuff. As I said before, the taste is rather unique. Some people love it. Other people, however, hate it, like me. One way to make it more palatable is to mix it with tonic water. This is called a beton from the be from Bekarovka and ton from tonic. But the word beton in Czech means concrete. The baton was invented for the 1967 World Expo in Montreal, Canada, where it became an extremely popular part of the Czechoslovak pavilion. In the days of communism, staff at the Soviet consulate reportedly drank Bekarovka mixed with Stoli vodka. A red moon is Bekarovka, black currant juice, and sparkling water, preferably matoni, which is also from Carlo Vivari. There's a museum in tour cost about 180 crowns, $8, or 245 crowns, $11, if you also want a sampling of four products, including a beton. You can plunk down more and also try another cocktail called a Becker 57, which is a mixture of Beckerovka Original, Becker Cordial, and a bitter aperitif they make called KV14. And of course, if you visit there, you'll also get to see Carla Vivari, or KV, which is super, super pretty. A liquor many Czechs think that they invented is Fernet. However, they are wrong. This is actually an Italian aromatic bitter, a type of Amaro, which is a digestive that dates back all the way to ancient Rome. Amaro is made by macerating herbs, roots, flowers, bark, citrus peels, and other items in a neutral spirit, mixing it with sugar, and then aging it in barrels. Fernet today includes myrrh, rhubarb, chamomile, cardamom, aloe, and saffron, and is made in a base of grape distillate. However, many countries produce some variant on this, and the one here in the Czech lands is called Fernet Stock, made in the Pilsen suburb of Bozhkov. The Czech version includes 11 herbs shipped in from the Alps and the Mediterranean, plus three from the Czech lands, and is quite bitter. Think Jägermeister without any of the sugar. After the financial panic of 1873, which crashed the European economy, a company called Leonello Stock was founded in Trieste, Italy, that made cognac. After World War I, they bought a distillery in Boschkov to help supply the Central European market called Stock Cognac Medicinal. In 1927, they began producing their own version of Fernet. The company was hit hard by the 1929 Global Depression, then it was confiscated during the Nazi occupation because it had been owned by Jews. The Italian parent company managed to get control again in 1947, only to have the communists nationalize it in 1948. It remained a fairly popular drink during communist days, but was often hard to get, sort of an under-the-counter tipple, with slang names like Cherny Svihak, Black Dude, Nafta, Diesel, Fermej, Varnish, Lakna Rakve, Coffin Varnish, Dech Mrtve Milenki, Breath of a Dead Mistress, Moch Mrtve Asfalterki, Urine from Dead Asphalt, and Machkani Stjernici or crushed bed bugs. Mmm, mmm, yummy. It's about 80 or 90 proof for 40 to 45% alcohol. Maceration of all the ingredients takes about eight weeks, and then barrel aging continues for several months. All in all, it takes about a year to produce a barrel of Fernet stock. The formula is kept under lock and key by a notary in London, but six of the 14 ingredients have been declassified, and we know what they are. There's gentian root, an herb with purple flowers, called horchets in Czech. Centaurium, a type of gentian with pink flowers, called zemjazluch. Roman chamomile, a medicinal flower. Czechs call it rmanec slichny. Quinine, a compound from the bark of the kinchoa tree, which is made to use tonic water and is a malaria cure in Czech called chinin. Nicus, which is a thistle-like plant that grows in northern Portugal and southern France, in Czech, Benedict Lekarski, and orange peels. Bunch of weird stuff that, honestly, doesn't sound that good, does it? That's because it isn't. Some of those nicknames I mentioned really tell the taste tale, in my opinion. I've often said that drinking Fernet is like licking the tires of a long-distance truck. But that's me. Plenty of people do like it. 
It really started seeing serious sales after the Velvet Revolution with 500% growth during the 90s, making it the most popular Czech liquor of them all. Then they came out with a lemon-flavored version in 1997, which is even nastier. Try and imagine licking a road that has had furniture polish sprayed on it first. And then this became the second most popular liquor in terms of retail sales. The whole company was sold in 2007 to Tenebro, which is a subsidiary of the massive American asset management company, Oak Tree Capital Management. Building on the success of their nasty lemon-flavored Fernet, they have come out with other flavors like orange, cranberry, pear, honey, spiced, mint, and blended with Caribbean rum and even more. But really, this is just putting lipstick on a pig. If I had to choose a gunpoint between Bekarovka or Fernet, I would probably choose Bekarovka. And I hate Bekarovka. However, mixing it, like with Bekarovka, can yield some pretty decent results. Mix it with tonic water and a slice of lemon, and you have a Bavarok or a Bavorsky Pivo, a Bavarian beer. It actually foams up a bit and it looks kind of like a dark beer. This is also sometimes called a BMW or BMW. Sometimes people like to take ginger ale or ginger beer and dump in some Fernet to make a version of a Bavarok. Sometimes they use Fernet honey. And there are other drinks as well, like one made with Fernet citrus, grapefruit juice, and tonic that I have not had, but it sounds nasty. The Boschkov folks also make Tuzamak, a slang term meaning domestic or homegrown, an ersatz rum not made from sugarcane like real rum is, but from potatoes or beets and then flavored with rum flavors and also things like vanilla or vanilla sugar. It's a very popular drink here partly because it is dirt cheap. It's about 35% alcohol or 70 proof. Because the importation of rum from the New World was expensive, a number of these fake rums started showing up throughout the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the early 19th century, often called tea rums or cooking rums. However, modern EU rules say anything that is designated with the word rum must be made from sugarcane, and so they had to rebrand Tuzemski Rum as Republica, and as so many of these distilleries do, they started making flavored versions of it as well, namely honey, almond, and espresso flavors. Sometimes people will mix Tuzemak with Kofala, an extremely caffeinated cola made in Ostrava, started back in 1959 as an alternative to drugs like speed to keep long-distance truck drivers awake on the roads. This Tuzemak Kofala drink is sometimes called a Checo Libre or a Bozhkov Libre. While Bozhkov is the undisputed king of the fake rums, a few other places also make a Czech Tuzemak, like Le Kuhnez Denitsa near Zlin and Uherski Brod in eastern Moravia, Fruko Scholz in Jindrichov Radec, Green Tea Distillery in Ustinad Labem, which claims to be the oldest distillery in all of Europe, and St. Nicholas in Liptovsky Mikulas, a town in north-central Slovakia. Drinking Tuzemak can also be seen as a sign of bravery. The rum flavorings are created by heating pyrolysis oil, a biofuel substitute for petroleum made essentially of oxygenated tar mixed with ethanol, manganese dioxide, which is an inorganic compound used to make dry cell batteries, and sulfuric acid. In 2017, a study by the European Food Safety Authority said that this combination can have serious genotoxic effects this means DNA or chromosome damage, which can result in cancerous growths. Another Boschkov classic is Zelena, which just means green. This sweet peppermint liqueur is the same shade as bright green mouthwash. It's made from macerating mint leaves in a wine distillate and then dumping in a whole bunch of other green herbs and finally some sugar. It's about 20% alcohol or 40 proof. It used to be pretty popular because it's dirt cheap, and as such, it was a favorite of students, supposedly also ladies, because, you know, they like sweet things. As we know, young people can often be creative, and so a number of different ways to drink Zelena have been developed over the years. There's the Magitska Oko, or Magic Eye. You get a shot of Zelena and very, very, very carefully slide it into a pint of beer. None of the green can spill out of the shot glass, however. There's also a weird game that can be played called Road from the Forest, Sesta Zalesa, but I've never really understood it. Uh, ask your Czech friends. There's also Jabi Hlen, which means frog mucus, sometimes also just called flusinets. 
To make this, you mix Zelena into a shot partly filled up with egg liqueur, which is a pretty tasty Czech drink that's like eggnog and we'll talk about in a bit. And the trick is to get the balance of the two liquors just right so that the consistency really is like, well, mucus. Or do this the other way. Pour egg liqueur into the zelena and it's called a sergeant or a soldier's brain. Chetarj or Voyensky Mozek. The brain part is that you must pour the zelena slowly in small circles so that when it's all finished, it kind of looks like a brain. And then I guess you drink it. The semaphore or traffic light is a layered shot with griotka on the bottom. This is a cherry liqueur, probably originally from France that tastes kind of like a sweet cough syrup. Then a layer of egg liqueur, then zelena on top. You must be very skilled to get the layers just right without mixing them. Pouring over the back of a chilled but not wet teaspoon is one trick to being successful at this. You'll note that the traffic light colors are reversed in the glass. The red is at the bottom and the green is at the top. So you make it correct by slamming the whole thing down all at once with your head tilted back. A wind from the mountains is mixing two parts zelena to one part alpa. Alpa is an alcoholic rheumatism cure. A water goblin's sperm is zelena with a dollop of heavy cream in it and the cream curdles, though you can use coffee creamer in a pinch. And finally, there's bacha, havno vtravya, which means, look, a turd in the grass. And this is fernet layered on top of zelena in a shot glass. However, serious drinkers consider all these to be silly kids' games, and no self-respecting adult would be caught dead drinking any of this. Is Zelena good? No, it isn't, unless you like drinking very sweet liquid toothpaste. You'll see absinthe all over the place in Prague and elsewhere in the country. Again, many Czechs think that they invented it, they did not, and actually what we have here is not really absinthe, technically. The anise-flavored liquor is made from a number of plants, one of which is the Grand Wormwood. This plant supposedly absorbs trace metals from the soil, causing it to grow in a twisted fashion. And as a result, absinthe also has trace metals in it. And if you drank extremely large quantities, and by that I mean ridiculous amounts, you probably would get deposits of trace metals in your brain, which then could cause brain damage, or so some say. What is known is that the wormwood plant contains thujone, a mildly psychoactive drug that has very, 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 very mild hallucinogenic properties. Absinthe is the green fairy that literary and artistic types drank in Paris during the Belle Epoque. The drink originates in the 18th century along the French-Swiss border and originally was pretty mild, only about 35% alcohol. Over the years, it has become much stronger, reaching as high as 75% and even more. Because it was so strong, it was often mixed with water and sometimes a cube of sugar. In Paris, a traditional way to serve it involved pouring some into a glass, then putting a cube of sugar on a kind of a complicated device that slowly dripped water onto the sugar. The sugar would moisten, and this sweet water-sugar mixture would drip, drip, drip slowly into the absinthe below. The sugar-water to booze ratio is usually 3 to 1, or sometimes even 5 to 1. So the anise flavor is minimized. There was actually something of an absinthe hysteria which led to it being regulated and, in some countries, outright banned. Recent scientific studies, however, have shown the effects of absinthe have been greatly exaggerated and so it is once again widely available, though different countries put different caps on just how much thujone it can legally contain. Australia and the EU allow 30 milligrams per kilogram. Quebec only allows 15 milligrams per kilogram. Ontario and the United States, 10 milligrams per kilogram. And in Manitoba, only 6 to 8 milligrams. In the United States, it was illegal to sell absinthe until 2007. Here in the Czech Republic, they make their own version of it called Bohemian-style absinthe. It often contains rather high amounts of thujone and has a very high alcohol content, usually around 140 proof or 70%. Many places make it, though there is a lack of consistency in the balance of ingredients. Sometimes, things that are labeled absinthe really are just anise-flavored grain alcohol, which has then been colored green. What you want is absinthe that has been distilled, not mixed. One way to tell is that if you put even a drop of water in distilled absinthe, it turns a sort of a milky white. 
Sadly, most Czech absinthe is not distilled, but is of the mixed variety. One way to make sure you get the real stuff is to go to a reputable place like the Hemingway Bar where they actually serve real absinthe with that drip, drip, drip method or Absentaria, which also has a museum and a shop with over a hundred different varieties of absinthe. Or you can just go get some French or Swiss stuff and skip the Czech Bohemian version. The French brand Amer and the Swiss brand Butterfly are both pretty safe bets. Pernod also makes a very good absinthe. But if you're here and you want to try the Czech stuff, some of the better ones are those made by Ancynthium 1792 in Mikulovica, containing 30 milligrams per kilogram of Thujon and 70% alcohol. They also make an offbeat red-colored version called Absinthium Red. This one is really a mixed absinthe, though they swear they macerate herbs once the mixing is complete. Reality Absinthe made by a company just a little bit northwest of Brno in the town of Domashov, is closer to the real deal. It's about 60% alcohol and has 26 milligrams of Thujone, though they also make a 55% version called Bairn's Father Absinthe. Likerka Tsarny makes an authentic, no kidding distilled version called Absinthe toulouse lautrec and Havel's Alpen Absinthe, which has no coloring at all, is also distilled and is only 50% alcohol. You can find more suggestions for places to try this in the episode notes. Czechs, of course, have developed their own drinking absinthe ritual. First off, many people just drink it straight, no water added. If they do dilute it, it's usually a one-to-one -one ratio of water. But the real fun is known as the fire ritual. Pour absinthe into a wide, low glass, not a shot glass. If you have access to sugar cubes and a slotted spoon, use that. If not, a teaspoon filled with granulated sugar will do. Quickly dip the sugar in the absinthe, just enough to wick the liquor into the sugar, impregnating it with the high-proof alcohol. Then, holding it away from the glass, light the spoon of alcohol-soaked sugar on fire, count to five, blow it out, and now dump the partially caramelized sugar into the drink, give it a quick stir, and then slam it. Some people do not blow it out, but dump the flaming sugar into the glass, which, yes, causes a big burst of flame to shoot upwards, so be careful. If you do it this way, you're supposed to wait until the fire burns itself out before drinking it. Make sure you have a glass that's thick enough to withstand that, or it will crack. Though people in the Czech Republic will tell you that this is how it was done during the First Republic, and so it's traditional, this is not true at all. The fire ritual was invented in the early 1990s by absinthe makers, but many people believe the marketing so much that it is now showing up in various Czech historical films about the First Republic that has people back then doing it this way. So, drinks that taste like Angry Christmas, or Licking a Highway, or Mouthwash, or that just mess you up. Good times! Besides Slivovica and the other Ovitsas, is there anything to drink that's actually tasty? Well, yes. There's one I've already mentioned, Egg Cognac or Vajchni Likir, which is kind of like an eggnog. And yes, it is delicious. The Bozhkov folks make some of this as well, though there are plenty of other companies producing it. Unlike, say, in the U.S., this is not necessarily a holiday drink, but a year-round offering. It's quite mild, usually only about 15% alcohol, and yeah, it's pretty sweet. Sure, you could just drink it straight, especially if it was warmed up a bit. It's thicker than American eggnog, so if you want to drink it cold like that, maybe mix in a little milk or cream. A classic thing to do here is get something called an Algerian coffee or Algierska kava. This is a Vienna-style coffee, which is strong coffee with a big pile of fresh, unsweetened whipped cream on top, and then you drizzle some of the egg liqueur on top of the whipped cream. And yeah, it is good. In other countries, this is sometimes known as an eggnog latte. Why do the Czechs call it Algerian? Nobody really knows. One theory is there was a big battle back in 1840 between the French and the Algerians, and the French folks during a siege started drinking brandy with their coffee, and then somehow that morphed into egg liqueur. Eh, that story doesn't really hold up. Another story says Portuguese coffee drinkers in the Algerian city of Mazagran adapted a local drink, which was iced coffee mixed with rum, lemon, and maybe some mint, and then somehow that turned into eggnog. Nobody really knows. Some people make their own Vajchni liquor at home. It's pretty easy. There are links to recipes in the episode notes, but basically it's cream, condensed milk, sugar, and vanilla mixed with egg yolks. 
Or, of course, you can just go buy it. Some people will also tap on a little powdered nutmeg or powdered cinnamon to make it even more delicious. The word grog used to refer to rum mixed with water drunk by sailors aboard ships. But here in the Czech lands, grog means hot black tea with a shot of rum or tuzamok and maybe a slice of lemon. Sometimes brandy is used as well. This classic cold weather drink has some similar friends. There's svajak or mulled wine. Wine that has been boiled with cloves and cinnamon, sometimes a bit of sugar. And every once in a while, someone will put a white raisin in there for an added kick. This is a staple of Christmas markets or any winter market, really. Red wine is most commonly used, though sometimes you can find white svajak as well, which is great. A variant on this is called punch, which is a bit more like the German glühwein. This is mulled wine with the addition of fruit, usually orange or fruit juice, and then sometimes they dump in brandy or rum as well to make it extra kicky. And then there's medovina or honey wine, better known as mead. This is made by fermenting honey with water to create a sweet but not syrupy beverage. Types of this drink have been made in Europe since around 1500 BCE, and it was one of the top drinks of classical ancient Greece. As a result of this long history, of course, different regions make it completely differently. In the Czech lands, where it's been made in some form or another since at least the 6th century CE, probably by the Celts, you can often find a hot version of it in the winter. But be warned, it kind of goes to your head in a sneaky way. I've often found myself having one and thinking, wow, that was delicious, and then ordering another one, but about halfway through the second one, the first one hits me, and pretty soon, I forget where I live. However, Medovina can also be served cold, and there are even archive and high-quality versions around in shops. Here in Prague, there is the Museum Medovini, or Mead Museum, which says it's a museum, but really, it's a shop and tasting place. They have over a hundred different types of mead from various countries, and the staff are super knowledgeable about the stuff. You can do tastings of classic, archive, or barrique mead. They also have high-quality honey from various producers. All those are great in cold months, but when the weather gets warmer, you might want something else. One thing you might see people do is mixing red wine and cola. This is called a hoba in Czech, which means mushroom. In Basque, Spain, they drink something similar called a calimocho, also sometimes referred to as a poor man's sangria. It can be quite refreshing, but also sometimes can cause a bit of a stomach ache. The Spanish Basques invented this in the 1920s, but nobody knows how the Czechs came up with it. Coca-Cola didn't come to this country till the 1970s. Kofala has only been on the local market since about 1959 or 1960. There's also cider, a bubbly fermented fruit drink, usually made of apples but sometimes pears, that has been making inroads here in recent years. Of course, companies are making the cider claim that yes, it's been a long-standing Czech tradition and now it's back, but they kind of say that about everything. There's a whole worldwide drinking subculture devoted to cider, which is a drink that's been around for many centuries with many, many different kinds of categories. You can even distill cider and then it becomes Calvados or Applejack. But Czechs take all matters alcoholic seriously, and old tradition revived or new kid on the block, many producers are doing their best to make the best cider they can. The big one here is Kingswood, made by the company that owns Pilsner Urquil. Stara Pramen also makes cider, as does Budvar. Smaller producers like Provoco, Mad Apple, Ross Bach, and F.H. Prager are also putting in a strong cider showing. Not far from Naplavka in Newtown, there's a shop called Dobry Cider, or Good Cider, that has lots on offer. There's also an e-shop online, Upili Yapko, or The Drunken Apple, which has a pretty good online store with many ciders for sale. And so, there's a lot more to drink here than just beer and wine. In addition to this smattering of local tipples and favorites, you can find pretty much any other liquor you might want in Prague. Sometimes even specialty bars that are dedicated to just one thing. Like for example, there's the Rum House Caribbean Bar, which has a terrible website, but a truly impressive selection of rums. Whiskies are all over the place, but you'd be hard-pressed to find a larger selection than Bar Amarula out by the Kobilisi metro station, which has what just might be the largest scotch collection in the country and is also one of the only places you can get the delicious South African drink Amarula, made from the fruit of the elephant tree. 
Think Bailey's Irish Cream with notes of orange and strawberries and a hint of chocolate. There's Whiskeria, located inside of a 15th century Gothic bell tower called Henry's Tower or Yindrzyska Wiege, not far from Wenceslas Square, which also has a great selection, and a staff that knows what's what whiskey-wise. Marpec, out in Prague 6, is also a great whiskey destination, and the Whiskey Restaurant, Bar, and Museum in Old Town, a branch of a very successful place in Tel Aviv, claims to have the largest collection of whiskey expressions, whatever that is, in the entire world. And on and on it goes. There's no shortage of places to get your drink on in this city. You'll note we are not talking about cocktails in Prague here because that, of course, deserves its very own episode in the future. Until then, Happy New Year and drink responsibly. (laughs) Yeah, right. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prague Times. If you liked this episode, be sure to like it or share it and tell your friends. Check us out on all of our social media platforms for extra goodies as well. Until next time, this has been Prague Times.